Okay, before NHGRI can um, issue a contract solicitation for a research and development contract, uh, it's required to have the underlying concept be approved uh, by an advisory group in an open setting, public meeting. And we've always used the advisory council for all FOAs that we issue so that you'll know the full range and scope of things that uh, are being planned by NHGRI. Um, now, um, we've heard earlier this, uh, this morning a presentation about the NIH Data Commons, and that was sort of a segue or introduction to the concept that uh, Valentina Di Francesco is going to present to the Council. Um, there will be ample time for a discussion uh, uh, with the Council, uh, but at some point when that discussion is concluded, I will be taking a vote asking the Council to approve or disapprove the concept. So, Valentina? Good afternoon. I'm Valentina Di Francesco. I'm a program director in the Computational Genomics and Data Science program at NGRI. And um, I'm speaking on behalf of the NGRI Sandbox Group. Um, this is a group of uh, program directors and program analysts that we have been working together for several months now to develop this concept. They're all listed here, but a special mention goes to Kevin Lee, Chris Wellington, and Ken Wally. Ken Wally is going to help me out with answering some of the questions today. Um, so the outline of the presentation is the following. I'm going to touch upon some of the current challenges that um, are caused by the genomic uh, data avalanche, uh, and they are associated to genomic data sharing and analysis. I will uh, describe the features of the proposed sandbox. Um, I will touch upon some of the available tools uh, for interoperability um, that can be used across different uh, emerging data commons. Uh, I, will, um, ta I will describe briefly the type of users that we expect uh, for this type of resource, and finally uh, describe the funding mechanism. So the challenges of the uh, genomic data sharing and analysis, uh, in an era with increasing sequencing capacity and decreasing cost, the bottlenecks are becoming more and more uh, linked to data management and data analysis. Uh, so for that reason, researchers uh, need scalable high performance storage and computing infrastructure and technical expertise. The problem is that uh, the technical expertise and the scalable computing infrastructure is not readily available everywhere at any research institution. Um, some some uh, research institutions have all of that. Some others really actually need a lot of help from that point of view. Um, uh, the other challenge has to deal with uh, distributing big data uh, over the Internet. Um, um, people have been complaining about the inability to transfer terabytes and petabytes of the data over the Internet. Um, they use, they use, uh, remove, they use hard disks, uh, tapes, and so on and so forth now. Um, and also, um, the distribution is very inefficient because in some cases the same data sets are distributed in multiple, um, in multiple local systems uh, or even copied multiple times on the same cloud resources. The other issue is that, uh, for example, NGRI is funding a number of uh, studies, sequencing studies, and uh, data resides in different local systems. There is little to no attempt in trying to consolidate and harmonize the phenotypic information that is being released, uh, that is being made available um, by the studies uh, to the rest of the scientific community. And so um, phenotypic data integration necessitates um, a little bit of coordination. Um, and finally, uh, and this is something that is uh, quite some recent news, um, NCBI uh, has, has recently communicated to NGRI as well as to other institutes uh, that it is reducing its data archival role uh, for the NIH. Okay, so this clearly imp imp has a big impact on what we're going to do in terms of uh, providing data generated by our studies uh, to the rest of the scientific community. So um, the solution that is proposed today is this uh, concept of an NHGRI data sandbox. Really for us, this is a resource that um, is meant to democratize genomic data access, sharing, and computing. 
Um, it leverages um, a scalable cloud-based infrastructure to co-locate data storage and computing capacity. We commonly use tools for analyzing and sharing data. Um, it provides both unrestricted and controlled access data and metadata from NGRI funded programs. It is a trusted partner of DBGAP. Um, with respect to genomic data, what I want to emphasize here that I don't mean just genome sequence data, but also data coming from epigenomic studies. Uh, and, and so genomics should be really used in a very broad sense. Um, the other thing that we would like the Sandbox to do is also to provide some data harmonization services across the NGRI funded programs. Uh, and also, um, as was pointed out earlier today, not all the tools are readily available and run on the cloud, on a cloud uh, platform with high efficiency. So we expect um, personnel in the Sandbox to actually keep on developing and optimizing the tools for the cloud platform that, um, that they will use. And finally, facilitate interoperability uh, with other data resources and data commons. Um, so you've seen these slides earlier today uh, by Vivian, so I am not going to um, go through it again. Uh, but it, you, know, you, you can just generally imagine that this resource will have some, an access portal, uh, user interfaces, um, it will implement security measures to make sure that controlled access data is um, kept private. Um, it will implement uh, fair uh, 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 principles, uh, fair, the fair guiding principle, and if they do not exist, it will help contributing to the, to the development of those, um, and so on and so forth. So I, I'm not going to go into the details of this slide. Uh, one thing I want to, uh, however, emphasize is that in 2015, the NIH has issued a notice that basically allow for the use of cloud computing services for storage and analysis of controlled access data that is subject to the NIH genomic data sharing policy. So uh, that basically is allowing us to propose this concept that relies completely on uh, a cloud platform for sharing data with the rest of the world. Um, and the other thing is that in order to do that, um, we are going to make a requirement for um, uh, the uh, cloud providers and for the group that is going to support the platform um, to utilize a cloud uh, platform that is FISMA moderate and HIPAA compliant. So um, you heard uh, uh, from Vivian earlier today about this uh, emerging concept of a federated data model. Uh, the one on your right uh, is the NGRI uh, data commons or sandbox. Um, we have been talking about what type of data sets we may want to use to initially populate the sandbox. We came up with a few. This, these are just proposals. They're not written in stones. And of course, the data sets will increase. They will change over time. But for the moment, we thought that an, uh, ENCODE, data that comes from the eMERGE network, um, data from the, 1000, the uh, 1000 Genome Project, and the data from the Genomic Sequencing Program will be good data sets to initially populate the sandbox. Sandbox. At the same time, um, as, a, as a, you heard, there are multiple NIH data commons that are emerging. Um, one of the, uh, the NCI genomic data commons, um, you, one from HMP, the one to support uh, human microbiome project data, uh, um, another data commons to support top made data from NHLBI programs, and uh, as well as uh, to support the uh, PMI efforts. So um, the issue always comes, and we heard it earlier today, is how are we going to make sure that this data is not siloed and is actually um, we, uh, this is going to be a, 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 a support for users to basically go across different data resources and deploy methods across different cloud systems or across different um, data commons in general. So uh, these are the tools that uh, we think will facilitate some of this, um, will alleviate some of the concerns with respect to interoperability. For example, the establishment of a common user authentication system, the adoption of uh, common APIs for data access and computing, could be the GH4GH or others that may emerge. 
uh, the adoption of fair principles, um, the um, uh, broad use of uh, Docker containers to deploy analysis tools on different resources, um, uh, catalogs of data or digital objects uh, so that people can easily find it, find the data where, where, they, where, in, where it resides, and also the adoption of common data standards and ontologies. I'm listing all of this um, because I, would, I want to emphasize that there are tools that are either already built, okay, and tools and technologies are either already built or that um, we're already working on. Um, some of the BD2K programs are actually really uh, pushing a lot of the development of some of these tools. So I think the real issue here is really mostly to do with, you know, social engineering and making sure that the right group of people are around the table to make decisions about common adoption of some of these uh, solutions. Um, so in terms of users of the sandbox, um, we expect two different type of users primarily. Uh, one is a computational genomic scientist who is familiar with cloud or high performance computing, developed a tool and wants to test it out or utilize it on a high performance computing platform. The other one is a researcher that actually does not have this uh, high level of expertise and may want to use uh, graphical user interfaces or interfaces to analysis workflows uh, to basically simplify their analysis needs. We don't expect really um, the genome sequencing centers to utilize these resources. One, because they have their local system and they, you know, they, they will probably will not need to come to the sandbox to do their own analysis. Um, and with respect to uh, what type of users also uh, will come to us, um, there are two types that we think um, will come to the sandbox. One is an individual user, a user that is not part of an NGRI funded consortium. Um, and they may want to upload and compute uh, on the sandbox and on, on the sandbox data as well as on their own data. They will be able to upload their data, combine it with data that resides already in the sandbox and do the analysis that they need to do. Um, so the other feature that is also very important is that they will not need to download the data from the sandbox. They can basically uh, do all the analysis um, where the data reside. Um, and by doing that, basically, we're minimizing potential data incidents. Um, the other thing is that um, they may want to have access to commonly used tools and workflows. Uh, as I said, one of the uh, activities of the sandbox is going to be optimize the tools and workflows in a way that will run smoothly on a cloud computing platform. So they will be able to use those tools um, and also have a, a workspace uh, for their own new tool development and sharing. So how will, so if a user, if a child user will want to have access to the NGRI sandbox, how would that happen? Well, we're not changing anything really. Um, the way that this is, works is the following, is that, that that's the way we propose it will work. That a user uh, will be a, a registered user of the ERA Commons. Um, it will have to submit a data access request to DBGAP. It will use all the data authorization protocols that have been put in place in DBGAP. So uh, if they're asking for NHGRI data, um, the NHGRI data access committee will review the application and will approve it. And then with uh, an approved DAR, uh, then the user will be authorized to use the data that resides on the NHGRI data sandbox. Um, no changes to the current protocol, basically. Uh, we're utilizing a system that is already in place with all the security checks on uh, approvals and consents and so on. And there will be no transfer of data from DBGAP to another system. Okay, um, so with respect to potential costs to individual users, uh, so the sandbox, uh, if you think of it, um, given what you heard, that means a user could upload potentially uh, terabytes and gigabytes of data, um, which is going to cost. Um, and we will not be able to basically cover the cost for all their needs. Um, uh, it's not a free resource. So uh, there will be costs associated to data storage and also costs associated with computing. Uh, and as well as cost associate, associated with data egress. Now, I have uh, provided some cost estimates just to give an idea of what the expected costs are. 
uh, I just want to emphasize the fact that um, costs are changing all the time. They are decreasing quite rapidly lately. Um, and also, the cost will change depending on the actual uh, tools that are going to be used, depending on the optimization of the tools that people are going to use, and so on and so forth. So please take these numbers just as a general indication. But anyway, the current data cost is about 350 to 450 dollars per terabyte per year, depending on the speed of access to this data. Uh, if you need to. Um, uh, uh, have fast access to the data residing on spinning disk, then it will be the most, uh, the most expensive version of that cost. Um, so with respect to computing, um, uh, you can imagine a user that wants to use uh, a, a standard variant calling pipeline. Um, and in that case, um, the cost that I was quoted is about $270 per sample on AWS, on Amazon Web Services On Demand. Or if you use the uh, AWS Spot instance, those costs actually are reduced significantly to $30 per sample. Uh, again, with a RNA-seq uh, analysis pipeline, uh, with the Tuxedo tool, uh, tool suite, um, basically the cost will be around $16 on AWS On Demand, or $2 per sample uh, for Spot in instance. Um, these are just an indication of what the cost could be. So um, the, the other type of users of the sandbox are potentially uh, members of an Energy RI consortium. Um, so consortium members could use the sandbox to have access to cloud resources where they can deploy new data sets and workflows. They have a common infrastructure to share and compute on consortium data. Uh, and they can take advantage of interoperability tools and data submission services to other data commons if necessary. And that includes also data submission services to DBGAP uh, in case they, they will accept those data. So, um, so members of a consortium could interact with the sandbox in two ways. They could either uh, have their own separate data coordinating center, and then the data coordinating center could submit data to the sandbox. Or they could basically leverage the data management services of the sandbox. So in, in all intents and purposes, the data coordinating center, some aspects and functions of a data coordinating center could easily be taken over by the data sandbox. And in that case, the, each project could basically directly submit their own data to the data sandbox for storage and sharing with other members of the consortium. Um, so uh, a consortium member in that case uh, who wants to access data from the consortium, all that he needs to have is an account on the data sandbox. Uh, in that case, in program officers will work with the NHGRI sandbox, will basically recognize the user as a consortium member, and they will grant authority to the relevant and appropriate data sets. So a user authentication and authorization is going to be done by the Sandbox in collaboration with NGRI staff uh, as well. So we think that this system should greatly simplify access to data generated by a consortium uh, compared to current methods. So finally, uh, with respect to the funding mechanism, as Rudy mentioned earlier, um, um, we're proposing this uh, resource to be supported through a contract funding mechanism. That is required to establish a trusted partnership with DBGAP. Um, and uh, the reason why a trusted partnership is, is necessary is because we want the sandbox to make accessible controlled access data to the broad scientific community. Um, the contract also allows us to basically um, have a clear set of deliverables and milestones that uh, the, uh, the staff of the resource will have to meet uh, for achieving additional, for basically receiving additional funding. Um, they will have to provide special reporting requirements, and mostly they will have to work really closely with NGRI staff. As I said, there will be a lot of interaction with the selection of the data sets that the sandbox should uh, support. Uh, there will be a lot of interaction with the type of services that the sandbox should make available to consortium members and to other uh, users. 
and so on and so forth. So the funding period is for seven years. Um, and really, this, uh, we selected funding uh, seven years because we wanted to make sure that this resource will have time to basically develop and also test, be tested in terms of its, uti its utility to both outside users and consortium members. And typically, programs and the GRI-funded programs are for five years. Having said that, um, as I said, there will be milestones that are going to be uh, set up for, the report, uh, for this resource. And so uh, if, for whatever reason, um, the project is not successful, we will not support it um, any longer. So the timelines, um, because this is a contract, uh, it's going to take a while before we're actually able to uh, issue an RFP. We think that um, we should be able to have an award um, in the summer of 2018, and, um, and we think that in about nine months after that, we should be able to have a resource that is open to the public. Uh, and will that, with that, I'll take any questions, and Ken, too. Ah, uh, Carol, go ahead. Thanks, Valentina. So um, I have a, a couple questions, actually, and the first is how how prescriptive do you envision the RFP being with regard to the data sets that are expected to be in this instance and the tools that are to be uh, available to the, uh, the researchers? Is that going to be uh, defined up front or is that going to be the responsibility of the applicant to actually come up um, with those um, ideas? So that, that's one. And the second one is can you say a little bit more about the governance model over those seven years? Is it going to be entirely um, NHGRI staff, or is there going to be an external advisory board as well, sort of monitoring progress? Yeah. So uh, pre uh, with respect to data sets, I think we will um, select some data sets to initially populate the resource. So we will be prescriptive from that point of view. I can tell you we had a, a lot of discussions, internal discussions, about what would be a good set to start with. But we really want to make sure that we start with a set and people know how to plan when they're making their budget proposal and so on and so forth. So um, with the tools, we have not had any discussion yet about the specific tools. <laughs> so I can't answer that question yet. Uh, the second question was governance body. Governance body. Um, with all our programs, we always had a scientific advisory board, um, so a group of outside members that will serve as advisors to, to this. So we'll definitely, it's not going to be just NGRI stuff. So in, and for that advisory board, is it going to be a combination of the contract awardee naming people to the advisory board and an NHGRI, or is NHGRI going to well, we, the what the, typically what we do um, with contracts, there are some people that are being proposed and typically any GRI staff will vet it and approve it or not. But most times we will make sure that there is no obvious conflict of interest in um, the management and oversight of this group. Before we get too much into the details of this, can you just Give me an indication of how this is different and how it relates to the NIH Data Commons. I'm still confused about that. Yeah. So this huge cloud <laughs> is supposed to basically give you an idea of a number of different data sets, right, from different projects across the NIH that are supposed to contribute to the NIH cloud. Okay. So. What happens really is that NCI has set up their own data commons, which is part of the NIH cloud. NGRI has to, would like to set up our own data commons, which is going to be part of the NIH cloud. And the question then remains, how will these groups of these data sets interact with each other? And what I'm saying is that we are either building tools that will facilitate interoperability on the NIH data commons. Okay. So, so they're all, all of these data sets, the PMI, Top Med, HMP, the NCI data, ENCODE, and uh, GSP, eventually they will all contribute data to the NIH commons. But, but then why do you need to have the sandbox populated with your own data? It seems to me the, sand, the set, what the sandbox sounds like to me is a workbench 
with all kinds of tools that you then use to access data that's in the commons. Because we need to basically facilitate coordination across all of these activities. Right now, the situation is that people are just contributing to the big app and data is not coordinated. Uh, it, there is no uh, help in trying to have tools that run across multiple data sets and so on and so forth. So if you have one place where you have the ENCODE data sets, the GSP data sets, with tools that run on it, I think that is a good service for, for, a user, for users. And right now, that is not doable. And I'd like to add that we also, if you look across the programs in, in HGRI, oh, sorry, when we look across programs to, just in our institute, I mean, we've set up, some programs have set their own cloud providers, and the idea is that this will help us provide an avenue not just for us to work interoperable with our own data sets, but also with other sets. And let's face it, we can't have one common, one cloud provider that's going to hold all our data. It's not, that's not feasible. So you're forcing, we, have, we really don't have a choice but to try to parse out these elements that we can and build it in a way that we can make it interoperable with each other. And I understand that's, that's, a, that's a challenge, but it's something that we're, at least the people, the groups that are representing this model here are working to try to build that in that capacity. So I have some concerns about the computing costs that you uh, uh, suggested. So you, you were estimating it would be about $270 for aligning a, a 30x uh, yeah. coverage genome. And uh, so, so I guess I have some concern that those kinds of costs might be prohibitive for a lot of users. Um, you know, so you know, if we contrast that to uh, you know, my own experience doing uh, things like that at uh, my home institution, you know, computing is heavily subsidized, and so so that would be sort of effectively free for us. Yeah. And so you know, so users are going to be trading off the uh, you know the, the clear utility and advantages of doing cloud computing against uh, against the costs. And I'm wondering about what your thoughts on that are. I mean, I'm just worried that the you know the cost might greatly hit the the usability of this. Um, uh I mean, it, it is a concern, right? But, but uh, the point is that not, as I said, our intention is really to make sure that uh, users, especially researchers that don't have a local system that can support this type of uh, analysis, can actually have a place where they can actually do it, OK? This can actually solve it. I mean, it, the, the local system is really not for free. I mean, in, in a sense, NIH is paying for the overhead and all the other activities of different institutions. But um, the, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true to some extent. But you know, for an individual investigator, you're doing the calculation. Is it cheaper for me to do this, uh, do, do this computation? Um, you know, on a server in my lab or on a system that I have locally, as opposed to in the cloud where I'm paying for the, right. the compute cost. So I can tell you that uh, there are now people that are developing tools that will give an estimate of the cost of your compute before you actually submit it to a, a cloud resource. That may also help uh, the investigators make a decision about you know <laughs> what type of cost they're going to incur and 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 decide whether or not they can afford it. But I, 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 I hear you. I, I know. First of all, thanks for a very nice talk, Valentina. And a comment and then a question. So, so um, I think some of what Jonathan is, is worried about is, uh, exists because groups like his and mine and people around this table and, and your funded community in general have not had this resource. Yeah. So, so one only wonders in five years or in X years forward if, if we would continue to make those decisions to build up our own comp computational infrastructure. I think that the idea of this, if it works, is that you wouldn't have to have any of any of that and you wouldn't be making those decisions. Um, but your point is, let's make sure then that we, we get it right. Um, back to Mark's question about how this relates to the commons as a whole, I think it is a good question to really um, understand what, what the relation is. And, and my question relates to your perceived allocation of, of, of or, or focus. So, so there's sort of hardware, w which can be broken down into computing versus storage. But then it seemed like there was quite a bit of a, of a uh, software construction and 
service component to your vision. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping you could clarify some of that. So for just to, to kind of give some concrete examples, you mentioned for seeing a bunch of data harmonization. Yeah. And that could be light harmonization or that could be a major activity. Mm -hmm. So for instance, would you recall every, every genome sequence in, in the uh, sandbox using a common pipeline? That would be very useful, but also a major commitment. Or, or did you mean other things by harmonization? And <clears throat> um, as another example, you mentioned that, that uh, simpler tools and web interfaces might be provided by the sandbox for users who are not computationally mm -hmm. savvy. And I'm wondering how many or how much development effort you foresee going into those tools by this initiative versus simply providing a place where some of us can put our, our, our tools we've already developed or are in the process of developing. A lot of, lot of questions I realize, but they all relate to the relationship at the ground level with the larger project. So with respect to what type of services um, the sandbox uh, is expected to provide, um, a realignment to a new version of the human genome I can easily imagine that is going to be one of the services. But once again, we're going to have a governance body, okay, including NGRI people and outside researchers that are going to tell us whether some computational exercises need to be done, okay, um, with the associated cost associated to it. So I, I can imagine the answer is yes to all of the above um, with a careful evaluation of priorities and cost. Okay, and that's the kind of thing that a contract will allow us to do. Um, so, what was your next question? Well, I think if it's uh, yes to all of the above, then it gets all of the questions. So, the harmonization part, the harmonization part also, what I was really referring to was mostly about harmonizing uh, phenotypic information. For I example. see. So, uh, standardizing right. information associated to data sets. Uh, and, and things like that. But, but again, I mean, we are going to decide over time, depending on, as I said, we're going to set different milestones, and the harmonization component is probably not going to be the first milestone, as opposed to maybe the fourth or the fifth. Um, <laughs> you know, we will have to set priorities about what we need to do first and then later. Other things. And then back with relation to the commons, presumably all of those NHGRI specific activities would somehow live in the commons framework that the commons is, is supporting. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a, a slightly different question. You, you talked in uh, earlier about milestones and, and sort of judging. Can you give a little bit more idea of what you're going to consider metrics for success of this, of this program? Yeah. Um, I have to admit, we have not really decided yet how to come up with uh, uh, the metrics for evaluating this program, and, and that's the answer. <laughs> so let me just add one little, so some of those are going to be built, and this is, as we're thinking this through, some of those we built off of what we've learned from existing models that are currently going on in both within our institute and outside. Um, we have certain programs where we are actually looking at, you know, things such as the usability, the user interact inter interactions with the data sets that are in different clouds as one of the matrices. Um, we're also looking at how are these da different data sets and, and cloud platforms that we have where we have data sets that are from different platforms. How are they being, how are they being utilized to actually work together and build a collaboration that wasn't already there? Those are things that we can also look at. So it's not completely in the dark where we're coming from as far as matrices that we would consider as far as milestones. Um, we're looking at this building off of what we're seeing the ground in the landscape um, as a starting point, understanding that that could potentially change as we move forward. Um, the sandbox is, uh, is not something that's designed, it's designed to be scalable both upscale and to downscale also based off of these matrices that we're going to put in place. Um, but that's to help answer your question, that it hasn't been finalized, but we are looking around the landscape of existing infrastructures and cloud platforms to help us guide us in that direction of what we should look at for our, our matrices, milestones. And, and I appreciate it's a, it's a very fluid situation and the field is moving extremely quickly, but it makes me a little nervous when your, your basic answer is, I don't know what those metrics are. So, so I, I, I can tell you some of the metrics that have been used by similar resources in the past 
what we didn't do is to make a decision about whether or not these are the ones to use. But I can tell you, uh, the initial population of the sandbox with data sets and making data sets available is definitely a milestone. Making this resource a trusted partnership on DBGAP is another milestone. I mean, these are key aspects of this resource that need to be achieved. Implementing um, some of the tools, like for example, a genome browser that will basically be able to serve the data to some of the users. It, and X number of tools, which we still need to define, will be another sandbox. So there will be a different staging steps for this resource that they, they have to meet otherwise. And finally, also um, another thing that has been done, which we def we're def I think we're definitely planning to do, is to provide incentives to outside users to come and use the data and test it out. This has been done by the NCI Cloud Pilots. And they learn a lot through the system. And I imagine that a version of that giving incentives to people to come and test out the resource so that we can improve it is part of the plans. What we, we have not finalized yet, what those metrics will be, but um, I, yeah, I can and, you... and I appreciate it. I mean, I would not expect final, final metrics at this point. You've got time to think this through, and there are a lot of issues that, that you need to think that you need to think about. But I would think that one of those metrics would be if if only 10 people are using this three years after it's it's there, you know, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. we're probably not where we want to be. And so. that's where you're seeing in some of our programs where we're testing those auditing. Like, how do we define what is the critical level of, of interaction with data sets to say you should be kept? And we're testing those out. And like Valentina, we haven't finalized those things, but we are looking across and implementing some tests of these, of these ideas of these auditing tools in different programs, and we're trying to collect that data. We are collecting that data to help better assess how we want to move forward. So can I just clarify, when people are talking about milestones, we're talking about milestones for the offerer meeting goals, or are we talking about milestones for it's useful to the community and it's getting broad use, or both? I, I was actually thinking more about the broad community, but I think the two are interrelated, so okay. it would be both. As you can tell from this conversation, this is a very rapidly moving field. The technology is changing, the nature of the data is changing, and the needs of the community are changing. What are the plans to stay very flexible and meet the changing needs, particularly of the community, because they are our constituents, using a contract mechanism? How are you going to interact with contractors, any contractor? So this has nothing to do with the solicitation, but how you plan on interacting in a contract environment to maintain maximal flexibility to meet the needs of the community? I, um, uh, so there are contract, there are contract mechanisms, and unfortunately I cannot go into the details, but we're looking at a contract, me contract mechanism that will allow us to have exactly that um, flexibility with respect to definition of tasks, um, and, and, you know, concrete projects that need to be achieved in a reasonable amount of time. The, 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 the mechanism exists. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess I had a, a couple of questions. Um, one, somewhat building on this discussion, you know, we started out and it was mentioned earlier this morning that one goal of this was to make it available to universities and sites that may not have this infrastructure. But I really didn't hear anything about training. I mean, those people are not going to understand, I mean, are unlikely to have the resources on hand to be able to use it. And I would certainly think it would be very important to build that into the concept. And I tried to look through it, and I also and didn't did. really see that addressed. I have to admit to being concerned about the seven years, particularly if you're talking about not even awarding it for a year and a half, if I understood correctly. Well, it, it takes a lot of time to develop right. a, a, call for, a call for proposals. But yeah. it's really hard for me to imagine what our compute space is going to look like eight or nine years from now. And so I assume yeah. there's some type of annual review of this yeah. or update. Because, yeah. Yes, yes. No, I understand uh, she can't talk about no, but, dollar amounts. No, no, I want to give you an example oh. of a contract that we also oversee that's very large, that just got renewed for seven years. Okay. 
that is um, in the past iterations ended up doing things that were not written into the contract from the beginning. Right. And so you can write these. I just want to assure everyone, you can write government contracts of the nature that we're talking about to be incredibly flexible, and they can be terminated at any time. Okay. Um, well, so that was my question. But. Yeah. Um, and I'm still a little unclear, and I'm not a computer scientist, on the storage versus compute space. You started out by saying dbGaP is limiting the amount they're going to store in the future, but it doesn't sound like you're talking about this space being long-term storage. So I guess I'm, I'm a little confused about the storage versus you know, accessing it for a year while you're computing on it, but that's different than... So, so uh, the, the news of, from dbGaP and NCI, NCBI is actually fairly recent. Okay. Um, and so as we were designing the concept, we were not thinking about um, this serving as an archival system. <laughs> right. We were assuming that that was going to be done by dbGaP. So it is a, a we have not, we ha still have to change the concept and decide what to do with archival. Okay. Um, yeah. um, I think I recall that many years ago, NCBI was criticized for developing tools for literature searching and things like that, that was pushing out private companies from doing that, that they sort of dominated that space and therefore suppressed the development of those mm -hmm. tools in the private sector. You're talking about developing tools for sequence analysis, and I wonder if you might be, if you're worried about being subject to that kind of criticism in the future. I'm actually, I mean, this is not supposed to be the resource. Uh, personnel on working at the sandbox are not going to develop tools as opposed to adapting tools to make sure that they work on the infrastructure and the interfaces that they have, okay? Um, Users, individual users or consortium members can utilize the computing resources and the storage area and the workspaces to basically test out their tools or develop new tools. But I don't expect the sandbox people to really be the people that need to develop new tools as opposed to optimize the tools that have been done by other people uh, and serve them to the rest of the community. Um, okay. Um, this is a, a very interesting proposal because I think um, having all of these different data sets together in the same place where you can compute on them is going to be really valuable. Um, on the, but on the other hand, I, I'm a little concerned with the cost. I think like, like Jonathan was saying. Um, and other than things like, like the Fly Stock Center and stuff like that, I'm not really aware of anything where where you have to pay to get something. Like, if the Santa Cruz genome browser, what you had to pay to look at that, people probably would not use it. Um, so I think the cost has to be perfect. Like, it has to be such that people, it'll be cheap enough that people will use it. And that's, like Jonathan said, a lot of people basically have free compute power at their institutions where even though the NIH is still paying for it, it's through everyone's indirect costs, so PIs don't see it. As soon as you start charging it on direct costs on their grants, it's going to be totally different. So this has to be so good that people want to pay a lot of money to use it, or it has to be basically free. Um, so I think that's going to be a really hard balance to strike. Um, and so I don't know if there's a way of you know, giving people like NHGRI grantees a certain amount of free use per year. Um, I don't, I think it's going to be very tricky. Vivian, were you going to talk about the credits model? That's exactly what I was going to say. Why don't you go ahead and say a few words about that? Right. I didn't talk about it this morning because of time constraints, but we're, we're working also in the Commons for what we call a credits model, which allows you to get dollar denominated credits from NIH for a grantee to expend on a collection of services in, in the Commons. And uh, that test is going on, we've got I think, 81 requests that have come in now, we're going to be testing it this year. The purpose of that is to see how are people using the data and to give them a method so they can actually pay for that and see what the cost is. And we expect the cost to be changing, in part because it's a changing landscape and in part because we see the cloud providers wanting to be more part of this. So there's a down cost, as in a reduction cost there. But we're also seeing this as a way of saying, okay, 
NIH would be paying for a certain amount in this credits model so that you can then use it for those services. Right now, that's outside of the grant system. The intent is to move it inside the grant system. So a grantee would get, say, an R01, wants to consume an HGRI data, and they would be able to get some dollar-denominated credits to then expend over that to use that. It gives us, uh, somebody was asking about metrics here, how much are you using and what cost is it? And what is NIH actually, actually expending on the use of storage of that data and the use of it? That's another part of the Commons model. Um, for those who want to know more about it, I can take that offline. Yeah, I think something like that would help a lot because if the cost model is wrong, mm -hmm. it won't be used. Yeah. And <laughs> so actually, my, my question was again about the, the payer model, and it's only mentioned in the draft as uh, that that the contract will be used to build a resource, but not for the users to use the resource, right? So there is, there's going to be expectation that people have to pay to use it. And then there's not really any details. So is the credits model kind of what the thought is for, I mean, I, it's really, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out if this thing was built and if I wanted to use it, do I use my credit card? Do I use grant funds? How, how would an individual user actually pay for use of this um, resource? And it, it's, very, it's very high level currently. Yeah. In here, I'm wondering if that's going to be spelled out in the RFP or if that's going to be something completely different. We will have to spell it out in the RFP. Yes. I I wanted to go back to the question about the single versus multiple solutions. Um, I can see all the value of having just one. It's already complicated enough and expensive enough, um, no matter what the cost is. But I also see the challenge, and this is a little bit about, I think um, Mark said that about, you know, it stifles certain types of innovation. I understand that the tools and analytical approaches are developed by anyone on top of it, but there is inherent innovation to the sandbox itself, mm -hmm. to how it's engineered, to the design choices that are made there. How would that be, how would that be handled and what would be the opportunities for opening up more than a single one and learning some lessons in the process? So I, I don't know, Vivian, if you want to say something about um, what NIH is planning to do through CIT and so on with respect to using multiple platforms. Um, what CIT is doing with respect to using multiple cloud platforms as a solution for NIH? Okay, but I'm trying to tie it in with what Viv, you were just saying, if I understood this right. You're asking, the sandbox itself is in for its own level of development, right? Yeah, I'm asking on the sandbox itself, not the general. In the NIH, there will be multiple solutions. They will all play with each other. I think we, we've asked that question before. Uh, here, there is a choice to make a single one for, right. the, for the NHGRI, and I'm only asking about that choice. So in, in terms of making a single one as opposed to more, using multiple cloud platforms, as you said, it's a matter of cost. Now, we are hoping that we can leverage some other alternative contracts that NIH is negotiating with other cloud platforms so that we could leverage reduce, you know, a reduction in the cost. <laughs> and, and that would be great from that point of view because then it will allow for competition across different vendors. Um, with respect to um, the science that goes into data management and to serving a resource such as this one, uh, absolutely. I mean, this has, will have to be an efficient resource, right? And some of the tools that need to be developed are brand new. Um, so so uh, there will be a component that has, is related mostly to computer science and data management that the, the contractor will have to be able to satisfy. Uh, and that will be reflected in, a, again, in milestones, in metrics, in efficiency, and so on and so forth. So um, we will make sure that that research component is included in this, but is going to be focused on the things I just mentioned, data management and support of the resource and finding efficient solutions for supporting the resource. Let's disambiguate because I think, Aviv, you're asking an important question, which is, the workspace itself requires work in itself, right? And how you do that across the different places. So it's actually a multiplicity of issues. The first one was answered just by Valentina, right? The second one, which is about the, across the platforms, is currently underway in part of the discussions we're having across the commonses. And uh, Valentina's comment about Andrea Norris and CIT is 
She's helping us with some of the negotiations for the cloud providers in the right place. We need to do that. Right? And then there was an additional kind of question related to how does this fit into the overall commons. This is an example of a commons. Right? The architecture is the same. We're all working on a very similar platform. What we have to figure out is how do we work? We're all doing similar things. Where are they the same? And where are they different? That's what we have to do. And we haven't done that yet. I don't have a sense yet of whether, are we talking about a single contractor that's likely to provide the services, uh, um, not one multiple award. contractors who will provide different components? We're looking for one. One award. One award, and they, have, they may have subcontractors. At them. And that's likely to be a commercial entity? Uh, or we don't no, know? actually, especially for the R&D component that we were discussing, we would love to see also academics applying uh, for this, to be okay. honest. And what's your, what do you anticipate will be the impact on uh, NIH personnel itself? Is this something that's going to have to expand the uh, workforce here in order to maintain this long term? Or is it uh, going to reduce staff uh, with economies of scale? Or what's your sense of the, the staff impact for this? You mean from the extramural point of view? or uh, No, really from the intramural point of view, of whether oh. interacting with the research community to help uh, um, maintain this in a way that the community wants to see this develop. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't think we touched upon that yet, but it's something to keep in mind. I'm, I... Just just one more point of clarification, kind of following up on, on Sharon's comment about outreach. So is is there going to be an outreach requirement in this, and the, the, or is there going to be a like a separate group funded to do No, outreach. there's definitely going to be an one. outreach requirement and training requirement. Right within the Right within this resource, yes. yes. I, I come back to the point that I think I made earlier, and that's the, the business of how you're going to harmonize this workspace. I, I declined to use the word sandbox <coughs> with other planned or underway workspaces at PMI, at NHLBI, and, and I don't know what the role of NCBI is in all this, except I just heard that they decided they don't want to have anything to do with it, and I'm not sure how that decision got made, but that's a separate question. So, so the business of harmonization with other, how, how are you going to arrange that in a contract that you're going to issue <coughs> to a sole vendor to make sure that, that they have harmonization with other vendors who may not be the same? Um, you, you make it as a task, as a requirement, right? It's it's that the require interoperability with other entities um, as they emerge. Um, Vivian said and gave a number of uh, emerging data commons. They're all emerging, and and you know the NCI the, uh, genomic data commons is adopting the GA for GH APIs. Um, we will probably keep the requirement generic without specifying a specific. APIs that will need to be implemented because, again, um, the, the world is changing over time. But um, what we typically do in, in the past is just to set up the interoperability requirement as a task of the contract. So I think this is another example of the importance of making sure that we are all working together between the Commons, NHGRI, NHLBI, and those other entities that we can. Because as we are starting to develop our language in our, our, in our contracts, that we have a better idea of how to make that language interoperable with each other so that we can have, so if we have a, solicit a solicitation, they understand what the expectations are, that it's not just for us, it's also how we work in the federated model. And I think that's how we're able to start by having this conversation with our colleagues in the, around NIH. And, and, and by the way, a number of um, as program officers, we have been involved in a lot of these discussions in the development of these interoperability tools. A number of program directors and a GRI have been working, been part of working groups and so on to make sure that these tools are developed properly and that we can adopt them whenever they are ready. So what's the vision for what happens after seven years in the best case scenario? If it's successful and everyone depends on this, is the idea to renew the contract at that point for another X years? Or would the idea be to internalize this among uh, intramural staff or some other idea? So at the end of the seven years, we would like to do an assessment of what has worked, what has not worked, an overall assessment, and which will occur annually during the process. And work, again, we look at this as working with the federated data commons model system 
and actually come to the conclusion of what should be the final step, the next step that needs for this iteration. What parts of this effort works? What parts doesn't work? Where do we actually need to focus our attention on as far as making this better? Because, you know, we're, as what Vivian's talked about, what Valentina's talked about, is what you've heard across the NIH in the community, we're still building some of these concepts out into, and we're going to continue doing that. So after the end of the seven years, I can see us actually being able to reassess and look at what the community wants, make adjustments, further adjustments, and do, you know, maybe another iteration with the Federated Commons or, you know, let the community help us decide what's going to be the best way to go forward. That's So I have one metric that might be too crazy broad to bring up, but why not? Um, you're looking like you're ready for something. <laughs> and that is, um, will there be an expectation that there'll be increasing numbers of, let's just say extramural funded right now, projects that will be cross-institute? That if you've got the capacity to have this, these interoperable data big data, um, what I want to say, um, focused on different kinds of diseases, but in, at the same time, you know, the, in a lot of things that are interrelated, do you guys envision that the silos that the institutes now are in? Now, I recognize there's cross-funding sometimes, I'm, I understand that, but, but do you think that, do you envision um, a model of sort of investigation of human disease in a way that will, that this can really facilitate cross-institute funding of projects? It would, would that be a pie in the sky metric? But it might be, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, my reaction, I, I, I'm not sure it could be a metric that would be a term of the contract. I can imagine it would be a metric for a term of, of whether we think this whole kind of line of development is a desirable one, that could be something we'd be very pleased to see, if, if, that, if that's what you meant by metric. I would agree with that. Valentina, I think you wore them out. <laughs> So we've heard. Uh, wait, wait. I think Jay, who's been very oh, quiet. okay. But so, so, I, mean, I think this is. I, I think it's a. I think it's a great thing. I'm. I, I'm very positive about this. I, I think. I mean, one, one question I had. Do you, do you? I mean, kind of the. You think about. You know, once you start something, it's hard to stop it, right? As we as we know. Um, uh, and and I'm just. I'm just thinking about, you know, one is is trying to think in advance about how, how defining. So and this came up a little already, but defining success in advance. I mean, do you anticipate that 10 percent, 20 percent, 50 percent of extramural investigators will use this? You know, hundreds, thousands. Kind of trying to before this gets going, try to have a have a sense in advance of how we're going to say that this was successful relative to the investment that was put into it, right? Um, and the second thing I was just wondering about is I could imagine this starting off and there being a temptation to, to issue RFAs where we require people to use it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious if there has been thought about, oh, we would never do that or, or maybe we'll do that. And because and, this, you know, if you do start requiring people to use it, then, then how well it goes will have enormous ramifications um, for everything else we're doing, right? So something to think about. Do you want to take the okay. So the first one, the first question, so I have to take it from Vivian, make sure I understood what you were asking, is how do you determine the validity of the sandbox itself as to whether or not it should be continued or shut down? Is that? How, how, how do you measure success, basically? And what, what are the expectations for success so, in advance in terms of usership? Or okay. So, that is still something that's posh, that's in development, but I could give you an idea of a potential way to do this. We can look at, first within the ERP programs, we can look at you know, surveys from the members who are using it and those who are not using it, and maybe they have their own, still have their own infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, and do a comparison analysis to see if what the sandbox is doing is actually fulfilling those goals. If you're on the outside of the ERP program, let's say an outside investigator, okay, we can track those individuals, you know, and I should be careful using the word track, but the individuals that are using that and send out surveys and audits to see if what they feel those efforts are, if this fulfilling their needs and their goals. 
Um, another thing that we could also do is actually have, you know, annual meetings to determine, you know, feedback from the scientific community. There are multiple ways to determine the validity of this sandbox, both within the infrastructure itself and outside the infrastructure with the community. And so that's one way that we can determine whether we should scale up, scale down, or shut down in those terms. Now, I forgot your second question, so, and I may turn out to be a, to Valentina for the second one. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I frown upon the use require. Okay, we would like to yeah. encourage. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I, so the DNCI Cloud Pilots have used this um, to give incentives to people to use the resource, which is, you know, a, a little bit of funding to experiment with the with the environment. Right, um, that worked. I mean, that got a lot of attention uh, to one of the one or two of the three pilots that they had in place. Uh, so, I, I, we. I actually, we, we discussed it proposing something similar to it. It's actually part of this whole project. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> Planning to do that. I, I just want to make sure I understand the intent of this, sort of at the grassroots level. At my institution, we have a bioinformatics core that will service people who do, for example, RNA seq and do their MatBax form and that yeah. kind of thing. Is it your intent to serve as that bioinformatics core for those people to dis displace my institution's bioinformatics core? And which wouldn't be a bad thing, frankly. <clears throat> the intent is not to displace it. The intent is to complement it in case some of the bioinformatics core at your institution cannot deliver on some type of analysis for whatever reason. Uh, too much data to process. The tools are not the latest version of the tools that people could use um, for whatever reason. It's really to complement it. I don't expect this to replace it at all. Because as was pointed out, there are some costs, and in some cases, People are not. Oh, I think it, your cost would be cheaper than going to a bioinformatics. Right, store. but in some other situations, to to scale up and try to deliver some um, analysis results on a large amount, a large amount of samples and data, uh, the, the the bioinformatics core may not be able to do it. I think what would benefit us, uh, just listening to this discussion, is a few concrete use cases. So, for instance, use, use case one, I am a researcher who has a few thousand genomes I have collected for my patients, say, or for my study, you know, at my university. Is, mm -hmm. the, is, is this a use case? So I would, I would upload all those data to the sandbox, and then I would pay a staff member who works in this extramural entity to assemble uh, a line against the reference and call variants. And then give them back, or and then deposit those in a file in uh, in that same commons. Is that is that the is, is that a use case you have in mind? That is one use case. The other use case could be you have a, a consortium that wants to work with the sandbox, and uh, they need um, they all generate terabytes of data. They need a place to consolidate the data in one place, and to run one pipeline on all of these data sets. That's another use case. Um, What's hard to, to envisage or, or to sort of foresee here is the amount of staff time. I think computing time is one thing, but then, for instance, our bioinformatics core, most of the expense, it's also very expensive, although, although effective, I would argue. Um, yeah, you, and, you and, would argue. <laughs> but, but most of, of, the, of, the, of, of the resource is actually the bioinformatic analyst. You're paying to do that, and that's not going to scale in the, the same way. As, well, it, it, it's a different scaling problem. Well, the bioinformatics analyst that doesn't have to be a sandbox staff member as opposed to uh, maybe the data managers of the data sources, okay? who will run their own pipelines and get the results and make sure that the results are shared across the centers. So it's not necessarily somebody that works at the sandbox as opposed to just making the environment for somebody else to run it. Mark, you have a follow-up, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's two levels of users here. There's the naive user who doesn't know how to do any of this analysis, and they're probably not going to want to learn to do it. And that's the kind of guy who goes to my bioinformatics core. There's the more skilled user, like Jonathan, I think, is alluding to, who uh, knows how to do it and is probably not going to go to the sandbox if the costs are, are too high. So I think there's those two groups of users that are wide, wildly different yeah. that are going to have to be dealt with. And I'm not sure one operation can deal with both of those but, groups. But even the, even the, oh, I'm sorry. It's actually in an answer now to both 
I think, from my perspective. I actually think that first for the, regardless which user it is, a lot of the reason that there is so much work going on into this, all these analysts and so on, is that things are done so non, in such a non-engineered way. Everyone, the data is sh is not sharded right. The everyone has to stand their own pipeline from scratch to basically do the exact same thing again with their own code in their own place and to learn the uh, best practices pipeline. They're not doing innovative work in this way. They're just doing the same thing again, again, again. They're moving the data around a hundred times, and the data is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, it won't be that movable for these type for certain types of analyses, not for everything, not for everything any of us necessarily does, but for certain types of genomics data, that's no longer going to remain a viable model. But on top of that, there's all this ma organizing and massaging and moving arounding that is not done in the best way. And even if it mimics the right analysis steps, it's not done in a very effective software engineering way. And so it's slow and it breaks a lot and it doesn't scale. And so I, I would say I think it would reduce the amount of personnel required, not increase it. They would still be distributed people in, in different institutes and so on, but they would, they would have something to work with that they don't have to build from scratch every time. And I think also for, but that's for Jonathan Moore to say for his own people, but I think for certain types of analyses done at scale but com by computational experts, at least I can talk about my own lab, at some point, you don't want to do it for yourself every time because that's not where your your core expertise is. You want to develop the next method, not to build the next infrastructure on which the method would run. I think it merits trying it out. It doesn't preclude everyone to still doing their own homegrown solutions, but that would presumably be the incentive for people to go in. So, so to me, I think the, the rationale for this is, is great. I mean, I think that, you know, the concept makes a lot of sense. And I think that the, you know, the only thing I'm concerned about really is, is whether the cost is going to be high enough that it, you know, people, you know, everybody's going to be doing the cost benefit analysis for themselves. You know, like there's the, you know, there's the time for the people in the labs. There's the, uh, there's the cost of doing it locally versus in the cloud, which may be, may be better for reasons you're saying. And so you know, you're going to go through these calculations. And you know, I think for this to be a success, the costs have to be low enough that people will go through that. And a lot of the time, they'll say, you know, yes, I'm going to take advantage of all the great things that are up in the cloud and the system instead of reinventing the wheel locally. And, you know, and there's going to be some kind of cost point that will make Mickey. each individual investigator flip one way or the other. Aviv. And, and the main issue with the cost is what Brenton said before. The actual cost could end up being cheaper, but most people live in weirdly subsidized worlds. And so they actually don't know the actual cost. I don't know either. Um, and, and if we know it, we don't care. And if we don't know it, we quote unquote don't care. In fact, we sometimes end up actually paying for it, not just through indirect costs, but we, we don't keep like a mental accounting of it. So we don't really know what we paid for anything because it's distributed in all of these little pockets and bits and pieces and so on. So it feels cheap even though it's expensive. Here it would feel expensive. Even if possibly, I don't know, it will be cheap. But maybe they would give it the, everything for free, the cloud vendors. That would be nice. <laughs> Bye, Brent. Um, yeah, I just have a logistical question and this um, part of my naivete. Um, since this would be funded through a contract mechanism, does it go through peer review and would it come back to council at some point down the road? It will go through a process called a tech, <clears throat> excuse me, a technical review, which is what you're thinking of when you think of peer review. It will not come back to council. No contract comes back to council. Yeah, we cannot discuss funding plans with council. All right, I'm imposing the five-second rule, and I, I was foolish to suggest that she had worn you out, but I think we do need to come to a close. We've heard a lot of good comments here, and the staff will bear this in mind, um, but first I need to call for a vote. Can I ask for a motion to vote? For I'm going to ask for a motion to vote to approve the concept. Can I get a second? All those in favor, and please hold your hands up. Thank you. Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. Okay.
moving right along. One of the working groups of council is the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Genomics and Society Working Group. Uh, I believe there are nine or ten members, and uh, Shanita, Gail, and Jeff, look, they're all lined up there. These are our council uh, members. Yeah, we, we clustered you together, right? <laughs> <laughs> With his microphone off. <laughs> Okay, and um, a requirement of any working group of council is an annual report. And uh, Lisa Parker is here. She's the chair of the working group. Lisa is professor of human genetics and director of the Masters of Arts in Bioethics program at the University of Pittsburgh. And she's going to give you the uh, report, the annual report. 